Good morning, good evening, uh, wherever you are, whenever you are. Uh, welcome to another Go To Unscripted. Uh, my name's Kevin Henney. This is Dylan Beatty. This is Hannes Loeth. Hello. And uh, I'm going to get these guys to introduce themselves and I'll introduce myself. We're going to kind of talk about basically tech, guitars, music, and the interrelationships. Guitars are tech. Guitars are tech, it's very, very true. Technical. So, yeah. Dylan, <laughs> you, 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 you introduce well, especially, yourself. Especially if you're Matt Bellamy, then guitars are like Well, we can, talk, we can talk about him because he does weird things with guitars, but uh, yes. Hello, uh, I'm Dylan Beatty, and uh, I never know what to write when they put job title on the form. Uh, I write code, I make music, I make music about code, I travel around the world and I talk about it, and uh, yeah, today we're talking code and guitars and technology and uh, all kinds of interesting things related to that. So, and Hannes. Yeah, my name is Hannes. Um, I've been writing software for like a decade and a half. Um, I started speaking about writing software a couple of years ago, just before COVID actually. And um, I really enjoy um, the finer arts of writing code and building guitars. So I think, I guess that's what brings me here. Cool, all right. Uh, my name's Kevin Henney. I've been writing code for far too long. Um, <laughs> I was going to say I'm a decade not, and a half. Yeah, yeah there's like nothing in his that. numbers. It's yeah. a rounding error, man. <laughs> um, and um, I managed to not play guitar for 25 years. There was a, a brief hiatus in the middle there. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but uh, my interest in terms of job, let's talk about job titles, I, I don't know either. Yeah. Um, Dylan and I work for ourselves, and it's just like, well, what do you want to be this week? It's just like, you chief know, you everything could, officer. Chief, uh, chief everything officer, yeah. um, you know, chief lavatorial attendant. <laughs> um, so th there's lots of possibilities there. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm kind of interested in, uh, I, I kind of had this interest in the relationship between skills, particularly transfer, because I, a couple of other interests that I have, I, I, fiction writing, short fiction, um, and uh, you know, just trying to see, it's just like, this is really interesting, learning about this helps me with that, or to be precise, gives me another perspective. You know, it's like standing to one side mm -hmm. and going like, they do this here and they do the same thing there, I wonder if it's for the same reason, mm -hmm. or they do this here, they do that differently over there, I wonder why that is. And it's interesting because there's a lot of that with software, software is information yes. stuff. Something that I've, I've often wondered there, it seems to me, and this is anecdotal, I don't have stats to back this up, but... Uh, we can make some up. If you, <laughs> if you get chatting to someone who's a musician, there's like a better than average chance that they are also technical. They program or they've hacked around with code, and vice versa, you find, I think, more musicians in something like a software conference audience than you would in the same sample of the normal population. And I've often wondered, is that because there is something about certain people's brains that's just, you know, code and music are ephemeral thought stuff. Mm. Um, there's nothing solid. There's nothing tangible that you can actually kind of touch and interact with. And so is that that certain people's brains are good at working at these kind of ethereal abstractions, or is it that those are the things that you get into if you're a lonely teenager with no mates? who spends a lot of time doing stuff you can do on your own at home, and I we think, just kind of end up getting good at it. I think there's even a third factor yeah. there. Um, to get good at coding and to get good at uh, playing music, that takes a lot of practice. Mm. Somebody can explain to you how you produce the notes or how you construct a class, but to build um, a song out of notes and how to build like a, a working software system out of those classes, that takes practice, especially if you don't want to get stuck in the mess that you created yourself. I think practice is interesting, but they are, you know, the, the, the massive difference between the two things for me is getting good at a musical instrument being, means being able to do the same thing consistently, mm. to be able to repeat and reproduce a performance. And, you know, obviously there's, there's improvisation and other things, but, uh, you know, someone who can't play the same thing twice is probably on slightly thin ice when it comes to, oh no, I'm a really, really good guitar player or piano player or something. Um, whereas in software, if you write the same program twice, that's a waste of time. You know, you're not supposed to do that. Yeah, you know, the, the craft of, of learning to play the guitar is like the craft of learning to type. And then everything else is what do you do with it after that point? Well, I think there's, there's another interesting one, and in, this is one hmm. of those things that they do that here but not over there type things. Um, that idea of repeating things, I do think has value in software. It's just, it's just trying to find the level at which it is. And so something I've done in a number of workshops is to get people to uh, do the same thing again. 
um, based on the principle. I, you know, and, and actually, it's, it's interesting to say, because I sort of say, okay, some of you probably play a musical instrument. If I've done the round of introductions, yes, statistically. <laughs> yes. You know? And sometimes you even have, in the room, uh, or in the Zoom, you even have enough people to form a band. It's just like, we actually have a drummer this time. Awesome, we've got two bassists. That's a big spirit. <laughs> you know, so you, you've got that. But there's that idea of like, well, you don't just play it once and go, yeah, I'm done. Um, it's a case, and what does that get you? If that's the first time you encountered something, so whenever get, I yeah. give people a, a kind of problem to work on, it's a case of like, if it's sufficiently small, I say, okay, that's really good. Let's do that one again, because let's list off the number of things that were new to you. The whole right. idea of whatever it is that we're learning was new to you. Um, probably the environment in which we're doing it, the problem itself was new. All of these things are new, so now you've seen them once, and we've gone through everybody's solutions. Let's do that again with that knowledge. Like make it conscious. Make it conscious, yeah, and sort of lay that down. And that's, it. that's the thing they do in other disciplines, but perhaps yes. we don't do enough of in mm. software. We could do a bit more of it. We don't want to end Is up this recreating. this what they call code cutters? Yeah, code yeah. cutters and beyond. Yeah, so exactly yes. that idea of like, and then also nudging those. Okay, just so you don't get in your comfort zone, mm. let's move that out a little bit. And, and that, there's another element, I think there's a crossover with music, and I think it's an interesting one because there's the playing the same thing again. And people like to talk about music as having a language. But how many people actually get the opportunity to speak in that? There's a huge variation across people that play musical instruments. It's the people who have who are very, very good. In fact, yeah, I've even seen this broken down, classical versus jazz. Very, very good at reproducing that. That's what they, you know, shove them yeah. inside an MRI and their brain lights up when they get it right. That Ooh. is what, that yeah. is their reward mechanism. Whereas, uh, you know, improvisational based approaches, it's just, no, the reward comes from creating something new. In other words, mm -hmm. yeah, it's like last time, but not necessarily exactly. And I'm gonna take a little deviation here. And that becomes its reward. But many people don't explore that side of music as much. And that, that is something that always struck me about piano music, for instance. Um, if you hear a pianist who is adequately skilled, um, and they play a classical piece, and they play all the right notes, it's, it's good. But then you get a really, really skilled pianist who can put the slight deviations in timing, they can do the phrasing right. They're playing the same notes mm. in the same order but suddenly it becomes something that makes you feel something. Is that, is that what you're trying to get at? It's like... Yeah, yeah. Like, it's, it's just like, let's, let's vary this and try something different. Yeah. So the thing with coding cartas that sometimes people fall into is, is they end up doing it the same way and then get bored of it. Yeah. Whereas I'm trying to say, okay, yeah, now we've, got, now we've understood the ground level. It's kind of like, you know, with a piece of music, it's just like, okay, I've got the sense of the chord, I've got the sense of where the chords go. Mm -hmm. Let's try noodling around a little bit because mm -hmm. I've got a kind of a solid base I can build mm -hmm. on. Let's just try pushing the boundaries and then doing things that are sometimes within expectation, but also sometimes this is wrong. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that's just, you know, it, it would be wrong by somebody else's move, but actually it creates something good. There's a, an interesting, uh, you know, guitarists learning to play fast. For certain kinds of, you know, jazz and, and rock and metal music, being able to play fast is something a lot of people yes. aspire to. And, you know, the accepted wisdom is, well, to be able to play fast, first you have to play slowly, and mm -hmm. then you speed it up. So you learn the whole piece with a metronome, and then you increase the speed on the metronome. And I was, uh, I was trying to learn uh, the solo for the final countdown by Europe, and just couldn't get it, because it's very, very fast. And I found a tutorial on YouTube which was saying, this is nonsense, you know. Being able to play it slowly, no, what you've got to do is hit the thing at full speed and see how far you get. And go back and hit it at full speed and see how far you get. Because being able to play it slowly does not, there's like a, there's a paradigm shift in the technique you have to use. And your fingers will not do the slow thing fast. Mm. And so knowing it, yeah, you know the music, you yeah. know the melody, but that doesn't actually help you with the physical technique required to play it. And I, you know, that I thought was a, just a sort of fascinating uh, counter perspective yeah. on what I've always perceived to be the accepted wisdom that the way to learn music is to learn the piece slowly and then speed it up. And you know, I, I, I thought that was that was really interesting. That that's there's an interesting thing in there. So to kind of bring it back to the software space. The that notion that there is that sometimes you can have two apparently contradictory pieces of advice and they are both in one sense correct. Mm. Um, in other words, there is the idea that of like... That has never happened in software. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. They are both appropriate, <laughs> but there's a contextual aspect. And more to the point, you've got to go at it with more than one idea. And you know, there's a kind of, there's yes. an idea of like, well, I've tried it that way. 
and this is the way I've been told. And that's what sometimes my, my sometimes my concern sometimes when we when we teach people or get you know um, uh, mentor people is just that is that balance of advice mm. of yeah. kind of like I'm going to show you a way, and I don't want to tell you it is the way, but. I'm going to show you a way because it allows you to make progress, and then you're going to discover contradictions and variations and all the rest of it. Um, but don't get too attached to the way that I've shown you. But at other times, uh, uh, you, but you can't just say or oh, do whatever um, yeah. because they don't know where to start. Because at that point, you know, it's not just that everything is possible. It's just like actually, I am confronted. A computer is a device with profound possibilities. Give them, give somebody a, a, a programming language, and it's just like technically, you can do anything. But that's the problem is somebody's trying to do something. They don't want yeah. to do anything. At that moment, they want to do something. And they need a little bit of guidance before they're able to break out. But one way might be the right way mm. today or for this kind of problem. But you've got to have that open mind and say, you know, because you've always got to watch out. If somebody says, oh, well, we've always, I've always done it this way. Every time I learn a new language, every time, oh, whenever we start a project, we always start with this stack. And we've always done it that way. The minute you hear that, you've got to go, you know what, you might want to try something different. I really, really loved uh, Woody Zool's take on this. You know Woody, right? Yeah. Mob programming. Mm -hmm. He's just like, if you have conflicting opinions in a team on how to do something, and in mob program, you're, you're going at it with the full team in the same room on the same computer, so you're all doing it together. Instead of wasting time discussing, what you do is you just do both, and then pick as a team like which one you like. You just make two branches in Git. It's not hard to do. And for maximum learning, start with the junior's idea first. Like, do that first. And then see if the seniors learn something, maybe another way than the, the, the thing that they're stuck in repeating over and over and over again. It's like, oh, maybe we can also do it this way. Mm. Or the junior will learn from the second attempt um, where they will like go in, at it in a different way. Um, but I always like this idea of instead of discussing, why don't we experiment? and try and see what works for us, yeah. instead of um, being fixed in our status quo and, and the things that we've always done the same way. And that, for me, very much is one of the reasons that mm. I like writing software. It's, it's like we, we get to do different stuff every time. Yeah. It's yeah. like a different business problem you're trying to solve. You're using different frameworks. You're using different patterns. You're working with different people. But every time and again, you're creating value out of something that wasn't there before. You're building something. Yeah. yeah. And to be able to do that same thing, like solve a business problem with software in so many different ways and learn new ways every time, that is what has kept me triggered in, in, in the software industry for, for as long as I've been doing it. And I don't see myself getting bored anywhere soon. Now, let's, there's an interesting crossover. Woody plays the guitar. In fact, he works in a guitar shop. Um, he's also uh, a very good woodworker. Wood yeah, he's the full deal. You know, yes. uh, you know, which is good. let's let's actually just let's let's, let's let's just land this straight back. So one of the things that so in software we have this whole software craft kind of thing, yes. and you know it, it's a metaphor that we apply, mm -hmm. um, and, and we use metaphors everywhere in software because otherwise we can't talk about anything. Yes. Um, you know, every single thing is. I remember realizing this once on a system work, work you know the, the penny drop for me um, uh, when I suddenly realized in our system we have four different things called network <laughs> and right. we're dealing with an electricity network we are dealing with a TCP IP network we yep. are dealing with a mathematical construct graph it's called network and there was one other and I suddenly mm. thought and yet not one of them is a network a network is a thing used it's another it's an older English word for net yeah. you, use, yeah. you use it to catch fish yeah. none of these are for catching fish yeah. and I just kind of sat back looking at the windows on my system and, and it's just like the desktop and, and it's just like and dealing with sockets and port and it's just like you know what every single yeah. damn thing oh file system everything is a metaphor so without metaphors we can't talk about anything but we import no. these things we've got architecture we've got craft and all the rest of it but I always find it fascinating and it's another one of those ones like move over here, see what they're doing over there. And when, and when I started uh, kind of writing fiction 
short fiction stuff, one of the most fascinating things I found was that in the creative writing space, they refer to what they do as the craft, not the craft of writing. We don't bother with extra words. It is just the craft. If you hear somebody talk of the craft, they are either dealing, they are talking witches' covens, yeah. or they are talking about writing. It's one of the few. It's just I was absolutely fascinated by this, um, uh, this, this kind of whole thing. It's like, well, what can, given that we're aspiring to this, or keep borrowing these things in, what can we learn from over there? Now, when it comes to woodworking, um, I still have all of the digits that right. I was born with. Yeah. However, I think that's a pretty close run thing. That's not an area of, that's a physical thing. So we're moving out to the information and yeah. virtual space. But you, but what I really like is the fact you are actually, you know, we talked about Woody, uh, yeah. you know, he's a good woodworker. You've actually built a couple of guitars yourself. So I this have. is like, this is, this is not just walking the walk and talking the talk, this is crafting the craft. No, <laughs> and what, in, 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 in many ways, um, building guitars and writing codes are similar. Um, and in many ways, they are completely, they are completely different. different. <laughs> yeah. And when I, when, when I want to first get into the, the whole crafting. Um, to me, the, the world of um, building guitars or woodworking in general um, is an industry that has been around for a very, very, very long time. They have figured out how to do things. They have had this whole trial and error stage behind them where they learned how to not split wood when you're using a chisel and what kind of planes you use to do cross grain and to, to go with the grain and all that kind of stuff. So there is a proper way of doing certain things. And what you're building doesn't matter. I mean, the techniques that you're going to be using is different. Uh, it's gonna be the same every time over and over. Whereas in software, we are a very young industry um, and we are still figuring out which techniques work for which problems. Which is why I've seen so many teams shoot themselves in the foot looking at what are the big guys doing? Like looking around, seeing what are they doing over there? What, what do they look at? They look at Netflix, Spotify, whatever. But they don't stop to wor wonder, it's like, okay, which problems are they solving? Are they my problems? Do their techniques apply to the problem that we are trying yeah. to solve here? So they shoot their own foot because it's, it's, they, they're faced with a different set of problems. But they're just trying to figure it out. And I, I think part of this is because we're still too young of an industry to have like a, a defined set of rules that we can teach newcomers like, if you go about this type of problem, this is the way that you can solve it. And this type of problem requires a different type of solution. I'm going to offer you a different take on that, because it, it was it, that one is one I've wrestled with for a number of years. I have a slightly different take on it. I don't think we are a young profession. Um, I think we're just immature, and there's a big difference. Okay. It's, 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 you know, it's, it's the, the difference between growing old and growing up. Yes. Um, I, you know, we run the planet. Software runs the planet. You're, you're we are just saying that because you're growing old, right? <laughs> <laughs> Nobody will notice. No. But there is this whole thing. Software development is older than any of us. It's yeah. that there are lots of professions that I simply do not know the names of these days okay. that are significantly younger. Mm. There are millions upon millions of people writing you software. Know, influencer software influencer isn't a real thing, right? That's <laughs> I'm not have to actually tell my a kids profession. That. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. not a real yeah. thing. You can't be. Yeah. But that's the point: is but, that we but, have. But that worries me. I have three kids, and two of them want to be a YouTuber when they grow up. It's like, oh, that's good luck like, with that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a game of probabilities. Yes, indeed, luck is everything. So, so that, that's the thing is, I don't think we are a young profession. We're actually older than a lot of the professions that people actually have jobs in. I think it comes more to the point of the consolidation. Um, and that's one, in other words, consolidating around something. And we have a very poor sense of history. That's one of the things I think in instrument making, which I find uh, fascinating yeah. as an outsider, is uh, along with many other crafts, you can, there's a traceable history. When we look at uh, architecture, yeah. if, you're, if, you're, if you're learning architecture, there is a traceable history. All of these things have a really strong, now we have a history, but we told ourselves we're so young we don't. Um, yeah. But actually I've done a number of talks yeah. where I say, Oh, this idea. So, you know, uh, uh, there's a talk I'm going to be doing um, uh, on on concurrency and stuff, and it's kind of partly triggered by reading something that said, "Oh, let's talk talk about new technologies like coroutines." Coroutines were invented in 1958. They predate <laughs> um, pretty much everything, yeah. um, and it's just like we have a very poor sense of history, which is why we have this kind of like sense that we are rudderless. And most of the problems that people are encountering 
In fact, they've all been solved. There's a whole load of problems Every, oh, yes. that have been solved. And so what, there's, a, there's an issue here, propagation of knowledge. That I think mm -hmm. that there is that. And again, that's if we look at something like um, uh, uh, Woodcraft, there's like a much better propagation of knowledge within a core community there than perhaps we have within software. So I think we're just immature. No, I, and yeah, I'm old, I completely <laughs> I agree with you that we as an industry has a massive problem with people not understanding history. Um, because, but then the flip side to that, you know, I remember learning woodwork at school, and the techniques that I learned in 1992 about how to create something yes. and make something out of wood are absolutely directly still valid and relevant today. The IT I learned in 1992 yeah. is obsolete. You can't even buy the computers, yeah. let alone, you know, I learned to do uh, BBC Basic, I think yeah. we were working on. Um, now, you know, I, I'm often, uh, something I think is interesting, we're taking a step back, is like, you know, there are professional developers out there right now who weren't born when I started programming. Mm. And there are people being born right now who we want to get those people to the point of being competent trustworthy professionals kind of as efficiently as possible yeah. without a lot of dead ends. And, and uh, we saw uh, Rich Campbell yesterday doing the, the keynote at NDC. And uh, actually, I've seen a couple of things talking about leapfrogging, yeah. talking about, no, never mind the next big thing, how do we start thinking now about the two, three, four generations ahead? And you know, you take, never mind like you got a, a room full of 18 year olds and you want to help them be professionals by the time they're 22. What do you do with the people who are being born this year mm. in terms of making sure yeah. that when they get to that point, yeah. they've learned the history that's relevant, they've learned the problem solving techniques and uh, you know, the, the, the data structures. And you know, the other, I think the other big challenge that we have as an industry is so much of understanding the context and the history is about learning things that you should never do. You know, mm. like we should understand how to, you know, create a relational database, but most of the time now people don't do that by hand. We should understand encryption, yes. but never roll your own crypto system because you're not smart enough to do that. And there's only one of you, and uh, you're not smart enough to know whether it's any good or yeah. not. And there's, there's like a tremendous amount of gatekeeping going on mm. in our industry as well. Yeah. It's like, because I had to do these things by hand, the juniors <laughs> that I am teaching should first learn how to do these things by hand before they learn the newfangled way of, of having a framework or a library yeah. or whatever that solves that yeah. problem for them. Good morning, and children. Today we're learning about the IIS metabase. Exactly. I have to, and, so you have to. And, and the history is yeah. important and, and the why is important, but like learning everything over no, again I think is that's, not a good system of getting yeah. new guys up to speed mm. on, I think that's on being the, productive I, programmers. That's, I think that's the interesting thing is there's the personal history and then there's the lessons of history. Yeah. And there's a very strong tendency to re -tra So uh, going back to 1992, pretty much everything I learned in software development is still applicable. Mm. Yeah. Not the programming languages I was using, no. yeah. not the platforms I was using, but the funny thing is, all of the books that, if I go back, and it's, 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 it's finding the level of detail that you yeah. pick, and it's, it's again, this is one of those things in music, for, uh, music and music mm -hmm. theory, is that sometimes we learn too intimately uh, without being able to take a step back. It's just like, um, it, it, that allows you to generalize. And there is this interesting idea of like learning at the right level. Now, something like um, woodwork is a very physical thing, and there is yeah. this there's a difference there that, we don't have the levelness issue that no. we have in software because there's a point at which ultimately everything becomes true. But that's the thing I find absolutely fascinating. Again, well, you're, you're going to use different tools when you're chopping down a log into pieces that you can handle to start processing than mm -hmm. when you're like carving out an inlay uh, into an already planed piece yeah. of wood. So there's still levels, but they're yeah, different. But inlays are still inlays, and that vocabulary. Yes. Is, is, whereas in software, we kind of have to take a step. There's always yeah. taking a step back because it, it goes to actually, Dylan mentioned it in terms of abstractions earlier on, and that's mm -hmm. exactly the right kind of way of looking at it. So, there's a kind of so again, there's one of those interesting differences. There is a, a groundedness, or chopping the chi out of the ground, mm -hmm. um, a groundedness to this stuff, but also with actually physically making, mm -hmm. physically making music. But there's another level at which the music is does conform to the abstract, the music itself, if you like. And so there's this kind of interesting idea, like in terms of improvisation, um, uh, or you know, what are the chord things that are stable? Uh, what, is the, what is it to make a song? That kind of idea. Mm -hmm. uh, 
and it, there's this kind of idea that that has been discussed and but still evolves and there are still parts of music that are very stuck in whatever they do and there are still parts of the gatekeep um, uh, uh, and in fact, uh, yeah, Hannes and I were actually on the on the way over here. We were talking a little bit about this, and um, yeah. I mentioned that uh, I, I, unfortunately, for reasons of COVID, I ended up missing a Skunk and Nancy gig last month. And if you don't know who Skunk and Nancy is, go check them out. You know. Th they, Listen they, to the post-orgasmic post chill album. Yeah, that's absolutely. Yes. Like masterpiece. Really, they're, they're, they're yeah. So innovative. So yeah, and you, you pointed out, yeah, they're, they're massively underrated um, for their contribution in the 1990s, and they were. And a lot of it was to do with gatekeeping. This is there is no doubt that that band, for example, was a rock band. But in the U.S., they were filed under dance because the lead singer is black, and it's just like, oh, okay. I wonder if that happens yeah. in music. Yes, all over. Do to what extent do we do that in software? And um, they did, as they well did as just manage to fuse song. quite a couple of genres in their music, but like dance wasn't one of them. Yeah. I was talking with some folks, uh, I was at J Focus in Stockholm last week, mm -hmm. and we had a sort of you know, impromptu session about um, you know, diversity and inclusivity, and one of the themes that came up in that conversation was uh, particularly women at conferences speaking about things like UX design, mm. and there's a sort of perception that that's not technical enough, and I'm sort of thinking, have you seen the software that we had before people started doing UX? Yes. It was horrible. <laughs> it puts the S you know, in I made of some UX. of that software. So. <laughs> yeah, it's just um, <laughs> you know, we had this, this whole, you look at the, the gatekeeping that goes on in elements of the tech industry, you're like, You've, you're not actually good enough to defend the thing you think is precious. Yeah. Because we've seen what you create left to your own devices, and it is insecure, and it is unusable, and it is hostile. Yeah. And you're there going, no, this is ours. You're not good enough to contribute. Yeah, and, the U you know, UX like is one, dis <laughs> testing is another one. There's a massive amount yeah. of gatekeeping against. Yeah. And I, I've, you know, we, we see that. And I like to think it is changing. I do detect there is change, but I've certainly been involved in um, uh, kind of uh, uh, dealing with companies that sort of say, "Well, we get a whole lot of developers in, and then you know, we make them all testers, and uh, and and then the ones that are really good become developers." And it's just like, hmm, yeah. And I bet you reflect that in your pay grades as well. And yet, surely testing is somewhat the most. Pro you know, you go to another profession. Yeah. What, let's put the word test in front of the word pilot. How skilled is that individual? <laughs> <laughs> and suddenly you realize there is an inversion here, and it's like, well, why is that not the case here? Surely to yeah. be able to understand something, to be able to stand outside it and say, I see this as a whole, and this is how this should work. Ah, and this doesn't. And again, that's yeah. exactly the UX thing. It's like, conceptually, so actually, how should this feel as a human being working with this? There's an interesting parallel just occurred to me. Uh, so the, the question would be, would you rather have a team of mediocre developers but really, really good testers, or a team of very, very capable developers with very little in the way of testing going on? And it occurred to me, this is kind of like you know, musicians going into a studio with a producer, because some of the, the best and most influential albums of all time have been a bunch of musicians who you know, were homeless drug addicts, let's face it, and the record company are like, you need to get them in and you need to make them work and you need to get this stuff down on, on record. And uh, you know, there are also, conversely, a lot of stuff, and, and you know, I put my hand up, I've done this, where you know what you're doing in terms of playing it, but you have no idea how studio production works. <laughs> and so you just plug the guitar and you record it, and you're like, that doesn't sound very nice. And then you just start and you make it louder and you put too much reverb on everything and it, it ends up sounding horrible. And you know, the producers are, don't have to be musicians. No. A lot of them are, but a good studio producer may be somebody who doesn't play any instruments at all. But really but likes music. They like music and they know what to look for and they know how to sort of direct and, and feed back to the musicians. Now try this, do that, do that. And the role of you know, testing and That's, that's and a software. very big yeah. difference in, in, in the studio, whereas uh, opposed to when you're on stage. On stage you want everything to sound the way that you want it to sound to the audience. Mm. It's very direct. So if you want your guitar to sound distorted, you're going to put distortion on it. When you're recording music, you're probably going to record everything a bit cleaner yeah. than you want it to sound in the end product because you can add effects and grit to it afterwards. You cannot remove it. So if it's you actually, put yeah. too much distortion on it when you were recording it, there's no way of rectifying that afterwards. There's a really, really good, there's a great podcast. Uh, it's called The Rule of Three. It's about comedy. 
Um, mm -hmm. And it's, it's, they invite someone in to talk about, you know, comedy and how it's created and everything. And there's a comment from that that really stuck with me. They were talking about music production. And they're saying, you know, the, the problem now is you don't have to commit to anything. You can record all of your tracks completely clean with no effects. You, know, you can record the drums and then afterwards change your mind about what drum kit you wish you'd played it on yeah. and just go and, and swap out the kit, yeah. which means that you get to a point now where it's like, right, everything's recorded, but we haven't actually made any decisions. Yeah. And then you suddenly have this overwhelming thing of having to you know, like put all the pieces in at once to get the kind of the arch to stand up. Um, and the point they were making, you know, back in the days of analog studio engineering, uh, day one, you're recording the drums, so you have to get the drums right. Mm. You know, you get the sound, you get the right yeah. amount of reverb, but then that's it. You don't have to think about the drums. The drum decision is made and that is now fixed. And so the next yeah. day you're like, we're putting bass or piano. Those are the drums, we can't mess with that. So we need something that complements that and works with it. Right, so um, anything, it goes back to the, yeah. anything is possible, but people don't want to produce anything. They want to produce something. It can become yeah. overwhelming. Yes. But that idea of, it's an interesting one because again, with drums, you know, we, there's, there's loads of stuff and go, go, on, go out on YouTube uh, and the web to find out, you know, uh, and how, how were Bonham's drums recorded for Kashmir, um, uh, you know, on physical, Led Zepp's <laughs> physical graffiti. Yeah. There's a whole load of stuff on that. Um, uh, th there's all this kind of discussion. And the, the point in the studio is that they, we have an option. There's a degree of freedom. Mm. And it goes both ways. Is that sometimes that could be too much. We can yeah. do anything. But sometimes the, 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 the artistry comes in constraint. There's a really interesting interview with um, I can't remember his name, who, who uh, the producer of um, uh, David Bowie's Heroes album, mm -hmm. who, who basically said, we're going to take Robert Fripp's guitar and we're going to put all the effects on it all of it now and record that. And people said, no, 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 just do, 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 do separate tracks. Do that. And said, no, we're just gonna put it on one. We're just gonna do the whole thing. And we are gonna commit to that. And that was an artistic decision to just really say, this is yeah. what the whole song hangs off. And we're not gonna start messing around and, and fussing around with it. That's not the degree of freedom that we want. Um, and, yeah. and working in these different, so there's an interesting, there's a, there's a space of variation that works and both for us and against us. Yeah. 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 So you go ahead. <laughs> I was gonna say, flip that around. Um, how much of the complexity Complexity that you've had to put up with in software over the course of your career is because somebody didn't want to make a decision. Yeah. Yes. You know. Let's parameterize. I don't know what to do. I'll add an extra parameter. Let's yeah. parameterize this. I'll put that in configuration, yeah. and then the configuration's wrong, and nobody understands yeah. the configuration. Yeah. The configuration is untested, you know. and so on. Yeah. The whole the, we need this abstraction in case you know we use ORMs. Why are we might change databases later? That's never happened. Yeah. You know, and that, yeah. that's like been the the beating yeah. the drum of best practice for my entire career. Yeah. The overgeneralization. It's, it's, it's been. Yeah. I was actually yes. building a, a, a ticket system for uh, for NDC and needed to send emails, and I was like, I need an email. To templating system, and then it's like, no you don't, you need to send two emails. You can have a method that sends this one and a method that sends that one, because there's only two at the moment. And you know, it was that sort of being able to go, no, we're actually gonna make a decision on this. Yeah. Gonna commit to something that works well for one thing. If it changes later, yes, there will be more work yes. to do, but it might not change later. So let's not carry the additional burden of all of that complexity and flexibility. Yeah. So. And there's a, there's an and also, also these there. degrees of freedom that you're talking yeah. about, it, it also really applies when you're building guitars because mm. yeah. we're all geeks, right? And if you if you get into the number of ways that you can wire up a couple of pickups in a guitar, that goes pretty broad. Yeah. And you see, I'm, I'm in a couple of guitar building forums and I follow a couple of people on, on, on YouTube and Twitter and so on. And sometimes you see these monstrosities that add all the possible configurations. So you can uh, do parallel series out of phase, all kinds of stuff, like to every yeah. single pickup. And then they, they have a whole switching mechanism to, to go with all. The, so basically what you can do is you can get 27 different sounds out of, out of a guitar if you yeah. want. Mm. So You're probably going to use four or five yeah. of them on stage. So having those 27 different settings, like I have to remember to put that switch in this position and so on, that is usually not something that enables people to create more. It's basically a limiting factor. Mm. 
So when I was family photo. So let's actually. So when I was I building do, this. Let, one, I want to look at the guitar. <laughs> this is this is Hans's latest guitar that yes. he built and chopped down the wood for. I remember that email uh, or that message. Um, <laughs> but also to give people an opportunity, if you're not familiar with guitars, um, what this we've just one. been talking. About. This, <laughs> is a, this is a guitar. guitar. <laughs> this is a travel <laughs> guitar. It has the scale length, which is how long the strings are, is as as, as long as an as, as is a this typical. Length from yeah, here to just, here. It's, well, what it's, is the straddle length on that? It's 25, 25 and a half. So yes. standard, 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 yeah. it's standard, standard fender. Standard fender. Yeah. Standard fender. What you see there, two pickups, and the point there is that you can choose between them and how they're wired together. Yeah. You can have them, and so for those of you uh, who have any background electronics, yeah, parallel or series, these produce different sounds. Even without knowing what sounds they produce, you're suddenly, oh yeah, there's a possibility there. <laughs> Just across a few pickups, you can well, do that. Well, let's start with the reason, the reason that I had for building this, right? I've been building guitars for a while. I started playing in Dylan's band, which meant that I was lugging my Fender guitar around the world um, to conferences, to just play conference after and parties. airlines love guitars. They really, they really love guitars. <laughs> and I had this beautiful molded case uh, for my Fender, um, and it got broken on two occasions. And the case, you, that is, not the guitar. The case, no, yeah. The guitar always arrived The case in did its job. Yeah. The case did its job, but it broke. So then you have to jump through all the hoops of like reclaiming the case from, uh, case from the airline. They'll give you a new one. It takes months. I have one that's in the pipeline at the moment that was broken in December. So I was tired of doing this. And the way that Dylan does it, he has this very small Steinberger that basically fits in his other bag, in his yeah. luggage that he can check in. It's like, oh, that sounds like something I want to do. But being a builder, it's like I felt like I wanted to do my own. And when I set out to make this one, when we get back to the degrees of complexity that, that, um, that we talked about earlier, um, I wanted to have a single switch for the pickup combinations because basically what we have here is three coils and mm. you can wire them together in a bunch of different ways to create a whole bunch of different sounds. And I wanted to have one switch with five positions with which I felt was going to be enough. Like to use on stage, that would be perfect. But I also made the mistake of trying to make this guitar as portable as I could be. Which means that if you look at it this way, this is only a 32 <laughs> millimeter body. Okay, we had, I remember this yes. exchange when we were talking pickups and options. So, and, you know. so the problem is that the, the switch that allowed me to do five positions that had all the wiring possibilities that I had that I wanted to have in this guitar was too deep for this body. It just didn't fit. So I had to go to two switches, which now gives me more degrees of of freedom, it also made things more complex because if I want to put this guitar into a certain configuration, there is this switch that configures how this double pickup works and that can work in three different mm. ways. And then I have a switch that selects between these two pickups. That's very classical. I can still reason about that. It gives me, um, you would feel like three times three, that would be nine different sounds, but when this switch is in that position, whatever I do here doesn't matter. So it's seven different sounds in this guitar. Um, but I already feel that when we were rehearsing the other day um, for our gig, I'm only using like yeah. three or four of those. Yeah. So it doesn't matter that it has seven. Yeah. Yeah. I just want those it's, four. I think, and I think that that's one of the things that you, you kind of look at some guitars and also some guitar makers, and they are bristling with options. One of the guitars I have, um, I hope, has a single pickup and two knobs. There are no switches. Mm. Yes. Um, and that's my, I, had, I used to have a single pickup, single knob guitar. Yeah. That was one knob too few. Yeah. I, need, I, like, I like tone control. You like that Eddie, tone I like it, yeah. Recorded Van Halen's debut mm. album on one guitar with one pickup and one knob and yeah. no switch. He, yeah, he yeah. is the classic yeah. kind of like, actually, it really is paired back. But I'm definitely not Eddie Van Halen. I'm, that's very, very clear to me. Um, but that, that the, so in other words, I, but I, what, but that guitar, one of the reasons I love it is because it has, it's just like, there's the sounds and you have limited variation and somehow it makes life a bit easier. Uh, my other guitars, there's Whatever a few Whatever you options, play is gonna come out of the guitar. Yeah. I mean, you're not fiddling with knobs or, or like, it's just So let's, you... let's, let's relate this back to, uh, and we've all seen those frameworks and those possibilities yes. and those extra bits and pieces. And it's just like, it's amazing what you can do with yeah. just some of the, you know, we compare it back a little bit too far sometimes, but there's a, sometimes, yes, yeah, sometimes you take it this way, but normally we're not, we're not in any danger of getting close to what we might consider yeah. the optimal level under abstraction or, you know, 
too few features is rarely the problem. We normally have a tendency towards, you know, and I'm going to say and guitar that, forums are going to be filled with a bunch of nerds. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they're different, they may be different oh, nerds, yeah. and a lot of them are the same nerds, going back to the earlier observation, yeah, yeah. but there is the same, there's that kind of love of possibility and complexity, the love of what and could just be. And like, just like in the, in the software world, where we believe that we need microservices if you want to scale anything really big or whatever, in the, in the guitar world, there's like a bunch of wits that have been debunked that still persists. <laughs> so like, for mm. instance, the idea of using something called tone wood. Oh, tone right. wood. There is, it, the, for, for the viewers okay. out there, I mean, if the you're building... The three clearly of one mind on this one. But if, yeah. if you're building an electric guitar, like the length from this point to this point, that is going to affect your sound. The thickness of your strings, that is going to affect your sound. The type of pickups, where they are, and how high they are mounted, yeah. that is going to affect your All sound. All of this is straightforward physics. That is physics. And remember, it's an electric guitar. What yes. happens is th there is a signal that comes out, and that's yeah. it. Yeah. So therefore, that leads to the next question. What about the wood? I think on an electric, we're probably not even up to 1% yeah. of the sound. It's, it's going to be a uh, fraction I'm, of I'm, a percent. I'm going to wave a little flag here and say that there is, I think the, the Tonewood debate is not as pronounced as journalists make it out to be, but I did once play a granite Stratocaster and the sustain <laughs> rang for days because the body absorbed so little energy. But then you're, then you're back so to physics. Yeah, but that's, but that's act, but okay, but that's, I'm going to say, yeah. we're out of Tonewood. I mean, the, you, this yeah. is true rock music, okay? <laughs> you know, it's just like, you know. <laughs> because honestly, what type of wood I make this out of, or that out of, that doesn't matter nearly as much um, as how tight this yeah. joint yeah. between yeah. the neck and the body is. Because yeah. if that is somehow, and loose is not the right term, but like... Sloppy. Like sloppy or it's not good, really yeah. packed together. And it doesn't matter if it's screwed or glued or neck true or whatever. If, if you have a good fit here, so that the resonation from yeah. the strings goes through, you will have pretty good yeah. sustain. So it's not a question of the, so the wood, the, the one that the wood has is the sound in the room when you're playing it unplugged, yeah. yes. and, and the feel. I think that's the one thing that yeah. is true, is there is a difference of the feel. Oh yeah, definitely. And that may change how you respond to it, but it won't change those a little electrical signals, the quality yeah. of those that are coming yeah. out. The contribution is minimal. Now, that's a, you, you've highlighted the tone wood debate. It's a, you, if you're not sure about this and you don't know, just Google. <laughs> totally. so, let me, you know, and there was a guy, uh, he had a YouTube channel, he made this during COVID. He started with a guitar. I saw it, yeah. And then he took a very expensive guitar and took a very cheap guitar and they put the pickup in the same position, same height, same strings, whatever. Yeah. The sound was identical. And then he went as far as mounting um, the bridge on one bench and uh, the... <laughs> um, <laughs> Nut. The nut on the on another yeah. bench, and there was literally air no between wood. them. Yeah. But this, the pickup, the world air same guitar position. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah we, we have similar interests. So, so, so let me yeah. ask, ask you a question while you got the guitar out. Yeah. And uh, th this is uh, we're going to get you to answer this on camera. We talk a lot about software craft. Yes. And, you know that is that is real craft. Yes. Yes. So, that, that is, so that's that's a metaphor. Show us the bits where you wish you'd had an undo button. Oh. <laughs> um, yeah, so See. that's one of the things that distinguishes anything, the world of software from the world of hardware is we have reversible time. Yeah, um, right. We have reversible time. We can undo, we can revert, we even have parallel universes, we can branch. We basically have all of the science fictional possibilities at our fingertips. Until you put it in production until and have customer data in it. Physics, yeah. And yeah. Until it hits the world. Yeah. At that point, things are a little less reversible, but there's still a little bit of slack unless you lose yeah. too much money in, uh, in making mistakes. However, so, so there's I a already here. told you about, I, I have a 20 euro switch sitting at home because it's a super switch. Those, yep. those things are expensive. That didn't fit because I I had routed away too much wood yeah. in this guitar, and there's no way to re-add the wood. The wood, wood is gone, so... I'd have put the switch in at 45 degrees. That's what I mean. But this, this cavity okay, is small. Okay, we can't reverse time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, For those go. of you budding guitar makers out there... If this was GitHub, I'd be sending that, you a pull request that. right yeah. now with a 45 degree <laughs> okay, switch right. on it. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, another one is I was routing out this neck pocket. Um, I had made a mold for it, and while I was holding my uh, my router, the um, it moved. 
So there's like a little piece of wood here that got I rounded away. Yesterday, yes. I was going to ask and about it. I had to shape and grain match a little piece of wood to go in here. And I wanted the grain to be in the same direction. I, I had to, that, that cost me like two hours to fix. That, that was like a, a two second mistake, took me two hours to yeah. fix. Do you know, I think there is actually a parallel to software I'm, that, that we, <laughs> you know, I'm really feeling it at this point. So, so that, that is like a stupid mistake I made. I didn't clean up this glue joint very well. So I could go back up and sand this completely and then refinish the whole guitar, but I only noticed when I was applying oil, yeah. which means that it was already too late. Um, any other mistakes in here? Oh yeah, this is an interesting one. So this is um, with a, a burn burning stamp that I put this in there in the wood. It's, it's my brand. Um, I had made um, a metal piece that would fit here so that the stamp would align perfectly to the neck so that I could just push it against and push it down. And it would be straight because I felt that was going to be important. So I had gone through all that uh, work, heated up the, the stamp, pushed it down, I had tried like on a blank piece of wood a couple of times, like how long do I have to keep it down to get like the correct amount? Because there's no one doing. If you burn too deep, like the whole area is, is, is ruined. Um, I push it down, lift it back up. It was upside down. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't, polarity. you don't see this, but this fraction of the guitar is actually sanded slightly back. I had to sand away the whole burst and like redo it. You don't, you don't see this. No. I, I fixed it pretty well. You but did. if you, you were did. to measure like the thickness of the wood here and here, that varies about three millimeters where I had to <laughs> curve this away and get... Just talk about it as weight relief. Unintentional weight relief. Uh, well, it's already, it's under two kilos, which is like really light for a guitar anyway. Um, and I'm happy that I bought most of the woods before the pandemic wood price um, it, it's ridiculous. This, um, this wood, which is uh, American Swamp Ash, um, it used to be um, 7,000 euros a square, uh, a cube meter, right? Which is already expensive. Now it has gone up to, to like two and a half times that. Wow. So this, if you buy a single beam of wood, like three meters long, about this wide and, and maybe this thick. That, that, that was already a 400 euro piece of wood. Yeah. And it gets even worse. So, um, but still, since you're buying, uh, building guitars, you only use very little of it. So the price of the wood doesn't really affect the final price of the instrument as much as um, pickups and, and electronics and all that mm. stuff, because that really adds up. Okay, the hardware is the limiting factor here. <laughs> and the amount of hours that you put into it, like craftsmanship, that is the big defining factor in, in what you're, you'll end up paying for any guitar. If you have machine-made guitars, that is, that is the problem as a guitar builder. You're mm. competing against brands like Fender or Gibson who have automated every step of the process. They can put out a guitar for 1,500 euros that is very, very hard to equal when you're building by hand. So you have to spend years and years getting better and, and perfecting every step of the way mm. just to get to that level. But then you're putting 50, 70, maybe 100 hours into a guitar, which means you can never sell it for 1,500 euros, right? I mean, that was, that was Leo Fender's great innovation. Because, yeah. uh, you know, Leo Fender, Leo Fender and Les Paul are two kind of, you know, iconic guitar makers of the, the 20th century. Um, and Les Paul was a musician, you know, yeah. selling yeah. recording artist. Uh, Leo Fender couldn't play the guitar. Yeah, it's Leo one Fender of those bizarre things you can actually tell uh, in certain elements. He of literally design. was like, I'm going to design a guitar you can make in a furniture factory. And that was, you know, the, the broadcaster and then the telecaster and then the stratocaster were all just, you know, um, yeah. bolt together the pieces of wood. He used the same paint that they were using on cars so he could get them all sprayed at the place around the corner. So all those iconic Stratocaster colors, they were what the car spray <laughs> shop yeah. around the corner happened to have available. So... And he also had this, 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 he solved, had to solve the problem of neck brake angle, like the, yeah, the yeah. brake mm. angle on the nut. Um, because before, before we were building guitars, you had this, this way of building just the way that violins were. The, the neck was tilted slightly back so that yep. you could have a break angle with yeah. a bridge here. Yep. 
And as you said, Fender, being the engineer, is like flat pieces of wood are the easiest to manufacture. Yeah. So yeah. he tried to get everything as flat as he could, which meant that he dropped a lot of the bridge into the body yeah. a little bit. That, and then here, also, we had like the slanted headstock. Well, this guitar doesn't have a headstock because I tried to keep yeah. it as short as possible for travel. Stockless. <laughs> Headless. But, Headless. <laughs> Headless. Yeah. Um, but that was angled for a reason that if the strings go over the nut and they're angled, that's a good thing. It means that this point of contact is solid and the string vibrates properly. Mm. Yeah. But if you have these long fender headstocks, like the, the, the upper strings, those tuners are pretty far away from this point, and because there is no angle in the headstock on a fender guitar, that break and angle here is almost nothing. Um, which is why on fender guitars you see these things called string trees, a little piece of metal that is screwed into it to just increase that's the break angle here. That's a hack. <laughs> it is a, a hack. hack. Yeah. Yeah. It's a it's hack. A, it's, a, it's a workaround. Now there's an interesting thing, going back to myths, and again, when we start talking about things like, you know, myths, um, there, there's a number of things we certainly see in software. There are a number of kind of like word of mouth, uh, uh, you know, oh, I do this practice because, and it's just like, well, hang on, that's that's kind of mythical. But there's a bunch of other ones. That, one of the ones I was absolutely fascinated by, when talking about the process, so the building like violins leads, me, leads you with something with an angle, yeah. and uh, mentioned Les Paul, um, and his guitars had, have all of this. Now, one of the most interesting things I, I think, traveling um, uh, a couple of years ago um, um, with a speaker who had a guitar, and I saw him just as he was checking the guitar in at the airport, and he was loosening all the strings. And I said, oh, that's interesting, why are you doing that? And he says, oh, well, you know, it's a thing because the strings tighten up during, you know, you don't want to break the neck. Yeah. I didn't really think about this one, and I thought, oh, that's an interesting thing, that's a point of experience as somebody who yeah. hasn't come across that, that's, that's obviously an experience guy's thing. Then I started coming across a couple of things, and eventually I found out, this is a, this is a side effect. It's actually nothing to do with this. It's to do with um, if you look at neck breakage. Yeah. It's all Les Pauls. There are I looked for Fender neck breakage doesn't happen. In no. fact, in fact, there are tales of people, particularly with Telecasters. Telecasters are serious guitars. Somebody was mugged. A, a, you know, country player yeah. was mugged on his way to his uh, on the way to his gig, and he had a Telecaster <laughs> guitar. He whacked the mugger and went. Yeah. Continues to the venue um, and played on that. Yeah. You could not do that with Les Paul because of all of this. In other words, it's an artifact, and people have built up all this religion about, oh no, you need to loosen the strings because that will yeah. cause. No, actually, it's in the design. It it's in the design of the design. And, and, and a lot of say, it, Fender was uh, Leo Fender was an engineer, and he said, okay, we're going to build something that works. And he did. I don't think he actually said we think, can hit people around the head with it. No. but that, that, that was an interesting side effect. But it did involve a couple of hacks yeah. and workarounds. But actually, it's an interesting the, the, one. The fact that, that, that Fenders are more sturdy. Yeah, the fact that they are more sturdy than. Um, Gibsons are a lot of a lot of it is due to the hacks that he took to make them easier to manufacture. I don't think yeah. he had sturdiness in mind. Yeah, but, but the a, fact that nice the effect. headstock was straight, yeah. meaning that all the grain of the wood is going straight and there's no scarf joint, it means that if you drop it on its head, like the forces are going to go straight through the piece of wood. There is no angled piece of wood on there. Yeah. Which, and the grain is all straight as well, so the piece of wood is very unlikely to break. Whereas if you have an angled piece of wood here, yeah. and the forces over. are actually it twisting yeah. it away. It's the, the same, the same with a straight off, yeah. and an angled neck joint yeah. here, which, which Gibsons have. They have this, this little neck yeah. tilt in there. Um, it's the same story. And the fact that the way that Gibson makes these, uh, because in, in, a, in a neck with an, with an angled headstock, you're going to want to make this out of two pieces of wood. Yeah. Yeah. Because you want the grain in the headstock to go um, straight with the headstock and the grain in the neck straight with the neck, which means that somewhere here you're going to have to join two pieces of wood yeah. together. And they are two pieces of wood, not one piece Because of if wood. you would just take a very thick piece of wood and like route it away so that it's at an angle, which means that in your headstock you have all these uh, pieces of grain that go um, like they, they cross through the, the, the headstock. That makes it very easy to break. So, but then this, this carve joint um, comes into play. And the way that um, Gibson does this is they move it a little bit too far back, mm -hmm. which means you see all these Epiphones and Gibsons breaking. There are ways to do that better. If you, meet, move, if you move that joint a little bit further here, um, you can actually prevent a lot of the 
neck breakage that you see in these guitar builder forums. I mean, I see posts yeah. every week so, where my so headstock an, has broken off. There's an important point here because, you know, you can kind of bring it into a close, um, <laughs> but also relate back to software, is that there, the whole point is, as you say, in the forums, and as I, I've noticed, mm. there's all these kind of like, this folklore that gets built up yes. and it's absolutely not grounded in reality. It's, no. it's grounded within a particular community that has mm -hmm. a particular focus and it's just like, you know what, I think I might have come across that a few times in software. You know, Definitely. these kind of like, you know, it, there's, there's a lot of that and it's a case of there's that, again, that, oh, that invitation to kind of take a step back. It's like, are we actually dealing with facts or is that just the words you got from your it's mates a, or you found it on a blog? End on a note which is, has nothing to do with software or guitars but which happened to me recently. I used to be into mountain biking. That was like the other thing. There was computers, there was guitars, there was mountain bikes in the 90s. And in the 90s, all the magazines were like, you have to have this, you have to have one of these, you have to have the bar ends, you have to have you know, 28 speeds with three gears on the front. And uh, I stumbled that across- That doesn't add up, dude. I stumbled <laughs> it's across- It's 27 um, then. 27, yeah, 24 <laughs> speed. <laughs> um, it has to be divisible by three, if you have I, three in the front. I, I stumbled across this article <laughs> in an online magazine, which was just like, you know, uh, 10 things, 10 horrible mistakes we all made in the 90s. Haha, <laughs> do you remember bar ends? They were stupid. Lol, you remember three sprockets on the front. I was like, no, we did that because you told us to. Like yeah. the press was all yeah. like, you have to have this and this and this. And you realize, you know, so much of it is just um, fashion. Fashion. Yeah. So yeah, we fashion. are, you know, in software, we are definitely a fashion industry. Yes. Um, like yeah. microservices on Kubernetes or? Yeah. Oh, microservices by yeah. Yasimiyaki. Come into a catwalk near you. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, thank you very much. Thank you, um, Kevin. Thank you, Hannes. Thank very you. nice talk. Yeah, really nice. I hope you got something out of that. I certainly have. Um, and feel free to at us wherever you find us online. About have guitar building or software. Yeah. yeah, and anything you agree or disagree, or anything we missed, or any extra nerd points. You know what's going to happen is people are going to skip the whole thing, and this is going to start a massive thread about tone woods. <laughs> That's going to yeah, be yeah. The that, that might and then be the somebody will come up and go for hey, but acoustics. Oh, so no, I, no, I think no. we specifically mentioned this was about electric guitars, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. There is no, a difference with acoustics, yes. and that is for another session. So. Um, when I start building acoustics, we're we'll going to have that conversation. For, yeah. Because yeah. also in that world, there's like lots of innovation happening. Yeah. Okay, right. cool. Have a good one.